Well, hey, we're glad uh, to be with you today again. And uh, if you uh, are around in the area, um, please stop by and, and see us in person anytime you can. Um, but we're thrilled to have this kind of technology to be able to share the word. And uh, I'd like to uh, start with prayer today and just ask God to be with us. So let's let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Um, and once again, um, that we have the opportunity to talk about it, to uh, read it, to study it, to let it uh, just dwell in us. So I pray you have your way in our hearts and minds through uh, your word today. And thank you again that we can do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in a series called Abiding Love, and we're looking at the, the gospel, or excuse me, the letter of 1 John. Um, and so we're going to be in uh, chapter 2 today, and I want to just do a quick little review to bring us up to speed, because we're, we're kind of in the third part of a section here. And 1 John is notoriously difficult to outline. We'll see that come uh, in play today, because he kind of goes back and forth between different subjects, and it's, it's not, he kind of comes back to the subjects a few times. And so there's a little bit of um, repetition, and I think it's because he really wants to help his church here get get these truths and be encouraged and warned as we're going to see today. Uh, but he's given three tests so that his readers can know if they're really believers. Like this is how you know you're in the faith. And the first one was obedience, right? He said, whoever says, I know him, um, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. So he said, we have come to know him. We know this if we keep his commandments, meaning obey. And the second one was the love test. He said, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Um, so it was, you know, the idea that Christians love, and that's a good sign that you're a believer by the way you treat other believers in that sacrificial love. And the third today is going to be about belief. This is about doctrine. Like, what do you believe about the Jesus of the Bible? And we're going to see in this section that this is probably one of the main reasons John wrote this letter. Some members of the church have left, they've left the community, and they're following some kind of distorted understanding of who Jesus really is. Uh, they haven't remained in what he says here, that in what they've heard from the beginning. So the, the doctrine, the, the, the gospel that's been passed down, they haven't stayed in it. And they're actually trying to deceive other people in the church to follow and walk away from the truth about Jesus and to leave the church. And because they distort this proper understanding, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. And they're actually called antichrists here. And we'll read the verses here in just a second. So this doctrine, this is a major problem because when you change who Jesus is, then what Jesus has done is no longer, it doesn't matter. It's not the real Jesus anymore. So um, this seems to be the reason he says we have to deal with this. And he's he's saying all these things about this is how you know someone's really in the faith. And it's it's basically, most likely, because these people had been teaching these false doctrines and trying to corrupt the church with it. So this, there's going to be basically three parts, uh, or really two main parts in this. There's just, we're going to look at some stuff about the false teachers, that they exist, their evil actions and deeds, and then the beliefs that drive those. But then, not only are their false teachers affecting the church, there are faithful followers staying in the church. And we're going to see how we can remain faithful, and that'll be by the indwelling spirit and the abiding word. So let's let's just start in verse 18, and if you want to stop it and grab your Bible, feel free to do that. But this is 1 John 2, 18. And I just want to read the first word. He says, children. And he's already said this, little children, beloved. Uh, there's these terms of endearment all throughout. He says, children, beloved, my little children. These are people he knows and loves well. John is their pastor. This is the church that he knows and cares for. And he speaks boldly and just directly to them because as Bernard of Clairvaux said, Boldly I speak because faithfully I love. He could, he could come straight at them because they knew him. They knew he loved and cared for them. And, and then he says, it is the last hour. I won't spend uh, a bunch of minutes on every single word, but I wanted to stop on this one for a minute too. Children, it is the last hour. According to the New Testament, we've entered what's called the last days, or here, the last hour. This is after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, up until the time he returns to judge the quick and the dead, as the old creed says. Listen to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. 
Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So these are the last days he's talking about. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about it in verse 11. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they're written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Sometimes we read these phrases in the Bible of the last days thinking, um, you know, there's just a couple days left or Jesus is going to return, you know, tomorrow, which he could. He can return whenever. God is clear that Jesus even said, I don't know the day or the hour. Only the Father knows. 1 Peter 1.20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. So the last hour, again, refers to the time between Jesus' ascension to be with the Father and his imminent return. We know that he can come back any time. And so we are living in these last days. Um, We'll get to the Antichrist here in a second. Um, But there's a lot. This is where there's so much speculation about how do we know when Jesus is going to return? What's going to happen first? What's going to happen during? And people get into the rapture and the tribulation, all these things. We're not going to get into those today. But just know that when we see the last times, it's the time leading up to the return of Christ. And there's no like actual time frame given on when that's going to be in Scripture. Uh, we can't like add up the, do the math and figure it out. So next, let's look at the reality of false teachers. Um, this is the rest of verse 18, and we won't stop on every word, like I said. It says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists, plural, have come. Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. She says one of the signs of this time is this this Antichrist. What does that mean? Uh, It's going to come up again in uh, 1 John 4, so we'll we'll deal with uh, more information about it then. But for today... The presence of false teachers is just a known feature of the times of the New Testament. Tim- Timothy, uh, Paul writes about it to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.1. Peter writes about it in 2 Peter 3.3. 3. We have it here in John. Um, he's reminding people that you should not be surprised that false teachers afflict the church. It's not a good thing. Uh, it should make us sad, but it's an important point. The New Testament warns of it all over the place. And, and Christians, I think we, we kind of know this is going to happen, but we're still often shocked, like when we have to confront it in real life, like in our own churches. We, we should always be sad about this and should break our hearts, but we shouldn't be shocked because God t- tells us throughout Scripture, Jesus himself said this. Listen to Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5, and then a little bit later, verse 24 and 25. Matthew 24 is Jesus talking about the end of the age. He says, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Like, I'm actually the Messiah. And they will lead many astray. And then later in verse 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead you astray. If possible, even the elect. Like, they're they're going after the church. See, I have told you beforehand. So, They're called antichrists here, or false Christ by Jesus, because they're against, they're teaching against the teaching of Christianity, against specifically Jesus himself. He called them false messiahs. Um, 45 years ago, and and the the anniversary date of it is actually tomorrow, the 18th, we're recording this on the 17th, um, 1978, Guyana. Right? You remember this? The Jim Jones was down there and they had this crazy like religious cult and there was about, about a thousand people there. And a senator went down to check on it because they heard these weird reports how people couldn't leave. They were overworked, underfed, and they were being mistreated. Um, but they were just all loyal to this cause of this bizarre religion that he had kind of come up with. Um, and he decided uh, the, the senator was attacked and killed with some reporters. And so um, he realized that people were going to come for him. And so he's the one that mixed in, I think it was cyanide. I can't remember which, some poison with the Kool-Aid. That's where we get the drinking the Kool-Aid phrase from. But 900 people gave their lives for a false 
prophet, a guy that was leading them literally astray, and in this case, leading them to, to physical death. I think there was like 85 or 75 survivors, and, and the reports were just brutal that we heard coming out of that. I was just a little kid. I don't I remember learning about it later. But there are people that they don't just misunderstand the Bible or get something wrong. They're actually teaching contrary to it. Um, similar to this. I mean, when people go after Jesus, it, it there, this is the Antichrist. So there's one Antichrist to come. Um, that's why John says, um, as you've heard the Antichrist or that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. And we're, we'll deal with this more next time in chapter four. But listen to 2 Thessalonians 2. It's talking about this one person that's going to come and really deceive a lot of people. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2, and are being gathered together by him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he's saying a lot of people are going to speculate, just like we have in our time, about when Jesus is coming back. Um, he says, let no one deceive you in any way. So don't don't fall for all these schemes about saying, oh, I know exactly when Jesus is going to return. Because it, 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 it's just spinning your wheels. He, he is going to return. The, the, the emphasis of the New Testament is just be ready. Be, be found faithful when he returns. Be serving him and sharing the gospel and doing all that like he's going to come back any minute. Just live that way. But then he says, the day will not come unless rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. This is where Paul is talking about this Antichrist, the son of perdition or the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And we'll come back more to this on chapter four, but there is some revelation. We'll talk about it too. We'll look at that, that there's an antichrist, a specific person coming that is trying to elevate himself above God. And that's going to happen sometime before Jesus returns. But He's talking about the many antichrists that are already coming or among his church that have left, that have been trying to, to wreck the teaching of their church. But then he says, here's the actions. Here's what they do in verse 19. These people that have been in their church, this isn't this future person. This is the ones that are teaching false doctrine, messing with doctrine in their church, messing with the gospel. John, 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us. So one of their evil actions was they left the church. Then he says, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. There's just they and us back and forth. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all, or they are all not of us. So what he's saying is, in this instance, some have departed from the faith. And he helps us to see this theologically. The New Testament is clear, again, that there will be people who profess faith in Christ and then later walk away. They say they're Christian, but they, they leave. This happens in our churches. Every church has people, most likely, that are still trying to figure that out, and they may, they may walk away. How do we get this? How do we understand it? He says, this is not the case of people losing salvation, that they once had, but they leave the community of true faith because they were never truly of us in his words here. They, they profess faith. They said they had that. They really didn't possess faith. Do you see the difference? I can say something and not actually believe it, not actually have it. So those who truly possess faith persevere in that faith. They continue with us, as John said in that verse. Again, so we're, we're, we're really sad about this. It breaks our heart. We shouldn't be surprised that this, this kind of apostasy happens. And it's heartbreaking. I'm not saying we should be okay with it and be like, oh, forget it. We still go after and pursue and seek to love those people. Um, it, it, one writer, John Stott, said, not because the endurance doesn't exist, um, because salvation is the reward of endurance, but because endurance is the hallmark of the saved. So this enduring till the end, these people that stick to it, it's, it's God's work um, because he's the one that, that saves and seals. And we'll come to how he does that in a little bit more here in just a minute. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.19 says, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. So, 
Hebrews 3.12 says it this way, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another all the day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we've come to share in Christ, if we indeed hold our original confidence firm to the end. So there's an encouraging that happens among Christians to say, stick with it. It's worth it. Endure. But God's the one that takes care of keeping us in him. And he uses other and his spirit and the word to that in circumstances and all kinds of other stuff too. So this is these, there, there are false teachers said so the Antichrist are, they're, they're here um, and there's another one coming later but they're, they're here and they're, they're trying to lead people away and one of the signs is that they left the church, they left the faith and they're trying to take other people with them. So that's the kind of the evil work of them and he hasn't even said what their belief is yet. He'll come to that here in just a minute. This is where John kind of goes back and forth. Now he gives us two gifts and two encouragements for the church he's writing to, to help them stand against his false teaching, stand firm in the faith. Look at verse 20, 1 John 2. It says, but you, it says you on the other hand, have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. You understand this anointing, in the Old Testament anointing was uh, at times a sign of the Spirit coming upon like the kings and, and different prophets. But he's referring here to the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave us. Listen to this. First, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1.21. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given, him, given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So this anointing is the Holy Spirit that comes and indwells every believer. So this is the first gift that will help us stand firm, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus talked a lot uh, before he left with his disciples about the Spirit. Listen to just a few verses. We don't have time to read them all, but we'll give you the references at least. John 14 is one of the main ones. 14, 6. I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. He's telling them, I'm going. They're like, no, don't go. He says, it's going to be better for you if I leave. And he says, this helper, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is the gift of God putting his Holy Spirit in us. Later in John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So these believers, John is saying, you've held fast, you've heard the apostolic teaching, you've received the gospel, and you, you've held to it, and you've been helped by the Holy Spirit. So take comfort. These false teachers are running amok and trying to wreck the church. You're doing well. Hang in there. Stand firm with the indwelling spirit. And then verse 21 of 1 John 2, he says, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And no lie is of the truth. He's used this truth and lie already a bunch of times. So he's, he, again, he's, he's writing them saying, I, I'm, not, I'm not correcting you. You're standing firm. You know what's right and you're standing in it. And, and you're holding fast to it. He's encouraging them in that. So one common trait of false teaching that happens even today is a suggestion in a couple ways. One, that there's some new truth beyond the scripture. Like, like you, you don't see this, or maybe it's a hidden truth in scripture until a certain teacher has found it. Like most people don't know this, you know, things like that. Whereas Christianity, the truth of just the basic doctrines of the faith, they've been the same since it started. We don't change things. It's not like, oh, we learn something new about Jesus that changes uh, his character or nature or the way we relate to him. It, it's all laid out for us in Scripture. And it's been held to for generations. So if we hold fast to the Scriptures, what, and what he calls here the apostolic teaching, we have truth uh, that we need for knowing and serving God. So this is what he's encouraging them in. John 16, 13 um, talks about the illumination of the Spirit, like helping us see the truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, meaning it's coming directly from God. And that's how we got the Word of God, by the way. Um, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. So you have the Spirit who is in you, the indwelling Spirit. Was also called the spirit of truth, like we just read in John 16. He's in, coincidentally the same one who inspired the writing of the Bible, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So when we read scripture, we're, we're reading the words of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus. It, it's 
the thing God gave us. So one way to stand and, and stand and fight for truth is with the indwelling Holy Spirit. God's going to do that in us. But then he switches back to the evil beliefs of the Antichrist. I said there was some back and forth here. Here's the lie. He finally gets to the problem with the Antichrist. What are they teaching that's so bad? What are they doing to be called Antichrist? That's pretty strong language. So remember, they've left the church. And now we see that they deny Jesus is actually the Messiah. And in so doing, they deny God as well. Look at 1 John 2, 22. Who is the liar? So what, what's this lie all about? It's he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Now remember, Jesus Christ isn't like a first and last name. It's, it's a title. Christ is Messiah. This is the Antichrist, he says. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. You can't say, I want God, but I don't want Jesus. You, you can't deny one and then have the other. Then he says uh, positively, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. The truth of Scripture will not allow any denial of the Son. It also won't allow you to separate them, take them apart, meaning like, I, I want one and, and not the other. You can't do that. What you believe about Jesus is eternally important. Doctrine is important. Some people say things like, oh, don't give me doctrine, just give me Jesus. Well, what you believe about Jesus, that's called doctrine. And hopefully we derive our doctrine, our ideas about it from Scripture. Our beliefs actually matter. Much about the Trinity, for example, is, is mysterious, like hard to get a grip on, but it doesn't mean you can't know anything about it. But the central truths about Jesus and who he is are clear in Scripture, and they must be held faithfully. The passage here, it, it, it affects how we respond to people. People say things like, well, all religions basically end up in the same place, or they all believe in the same God. The, the Bible is clear that there are distinctives about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we have to hold to in order to be Christian. That Jesus is both God and man. That Jesus actually did live a perfect life. If I deny these things about Jesus, or if I change some of the things about him, I'm actually denying the Father. You can't make up your own Jesus. No one truly worships God as he is if he denies the deity of Jesus. This is central to Christianity. And that's, these Antichrists, we don't know exactly what they were saying, but they were definitely denying that Jesus is the, is the Christ, that salvation is not in Jesus. Jesus didn't accomplish what he did on the cross and through his burial and resurrection. He didn't do that. He didn't pay the penalty for sins. They were saying something about how this salvation was not through Jesus. So this is massive to John. He's saying, don't fall for this. Then he gets back to the second thing that is a way for us to stand or fight against this false teaching. And it's in verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. So this is the word of God. This is the abiding word. John, again, encouraged them, stick to the gospel and the message of salvation that they already know. Don't distort it. Don't add to it. Don't take anything away from it. It's the pure truth of the gospel. 2 Peter 1.16 says it this way. It's a passage I mentioned that later talks about the Holy Spirit inspiring uh, the word. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He says, we didn't come and try to trick you into believing it or, or, or be clever or, or come up with some kind of, you know, really uh, crazy way to tell you the story or some innovative way. He said, we just, we just told you what we saw. We just laid it out. Jesus came and this is what he did. Um, the church has been diligent over the years. I don't mean our church. I mean the church, capital C, all over the world, has been diligent for centuries to make sure that we, we have councils and creeds and things to guard the truth to say, this is what Christianity is. It's not that we have to agree on every little thing and every single verse in the Bible, but we call it, in our church, we have a thing called the statement of faith, and it's just the core doctrines of Christianity. And almost any church, any Christian church would agree with those. There's, you know, we, we say things like, Jesus is going to return. Some people say, well, I think he's going to return after this tribulation. I say, oh, no, it's in the middle of it. Or some people say, oh, the tribulation is something in the past. And, and we, don't, we don't have all the details of that in there because we want to just keep our statement of faith the simple points of the Christian faith. Those things are good to talk about and debate and figure out, but 
those aren't like key tenets. Like what you believe about the rapture, for example, isn't a salvation issue. It's an issue that, you know, it's fun to think about, maybe not fun for some of you, but interesting to look into and see what the Bible says. But the key doctrines of the faith that are essential are the ones John has in mind here. We have to be on guard um, against these teachings that are coming against it. A couple, uh, just quick examples. There's a thing called progressive Christianity, and, and people have different names for it. You might hear people, I'm, I'm deconstructing my faith. Um, and it, it's basically, a, it takes out key tenets of things like the Bible is the word of God. Uh, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for sins. It takes out core tenets of Christianity and makes it not Christianity anymore. Uh, one book that came out recently that I recommend is called Another Gospel by Alyssa Childers. And she went through that exact thing. She was a, a Christian pop rock star when she was younger, and she went to, ended up at this church, and, and the pastor you know, had a Bible study going on. I don't remember all the details, but he basically just said, you know what? The Word of God isn't really reliable. I mean, we have a corrupt text, and he, he, she was like, whoa, and she kind of got caught up into this and, and came back around and really started studying apologetics and how we got our Bible and, and the, just some of the basic doctrines, and now she's just on fire to say, don't fall for this stuff. It's insidious. A little TikTok video or Instagram post or a meme can say something that, that's just not true and just kind of chip away at the truth. And she came back around as a strong, uh, she's a great apologist. She does a great job. Another thing called Side B Christianity, that's a recent innovation in the church, a new thing that's been made up in recent history, uh, really out of a heart to like help show love to people that are in like the gay lifestyle and, and are, 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 or maybe are even struggling in that. And it was, it was this kind of attempt to figure out how to love them better and, and be kind to them, which is all awesome intentions and what we should be doing. But it came up with a, a little bit of a twist on what the Bible says about sexuality so that there was a little open door and it, 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 it's eroding at the truth. So what normally happens is some, some little truth is distorted, like there's a partial truth or a half truth, uh, and, or maybe a twist to it, or maybe you add on something, and that's where we have to be on guard. And the Word of God is where we evaluate all of this. It's how we investigate. That's how we, as John is a faithful pastor here, working diligently to protect his flock from false teaching. And he doesn't say, just do what I tell you, or don't think about it. But he says, stick to the truth that you've received. Let the Spirit guide you and lead you in that, and God will take care of you. I love it. He says in verse 26, just two more verses, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So listen, I'm just warning you. The, the people that have left the church and denied Jesus, they're trying to trick you. But the anointing that you receive, that's the Spirit from Him, abides in you. That's the indwelling Spirit we talked about. You have no need that anyone should teach you. We'll talk about that phrase in just a second. But as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Now, if you, I don't know if you heard this. He's talking about the Spirit abiding in them. And he says, you have no need that anyone should teach you. So some people read that and said, I'm good. Like John just said, we can't misunderstand that comment. Have no need that anyone should teach you because if we have the Holy Spirit, some say, well, then we don't need any human teachers. Like I don't need to go to church. I don't need to read a Bible study or, or listen to a sermon or whatever, or have a discussion with friends in a small group because I have the spirit. And some people mistakenly understood it that way. That would not only fly in the face of the rest of the new Testament that actually is teaching um, and the command for it, but it would render the first John useless because that's what he's doing is teaching. And so that's not what he's saying. He's not at the same time saying, uh, I'm going to teach you some things and teaching is unnecessary. That doesn't make any sense. Those are obviously a contradiction. But what he's saying is you don't need anyone to lay again the basic foundation of belief. You've already received the gospel and, and live in that. Stay there in that. The Holy Spirit and apostolic teaching has shown them the foundation of their faith. So false teachers commonly suggest that you have to scrap all previous teaching from the Bible. And he says, that's just not true. He's saying the opposite. He urges them to abide in God and the teaching as they've received it. So the second thing is the abiding words. You have the, you have the indwelling spirit in the abiding word of the two ways to stand strong against false teaching and, and, and to guard your heart against people that are, you know, they, they leave Christ in the church. 
how can we respond? Here's just a few ideas, and there's so many things that we could say here. I just thought of a couple. Um, but remember this. Realize that what you believe about Jesus actually matters. Like, it's a, it's a matter of eternal significance. Verse 25 said it this way. This is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. This isn't just a thing like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a religion because that's what people do. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider Jesus because he seemed like a good guy and he had some great things to say. No, this is a matter of eternity. If Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, if he died and was buried and rose again, this changes everything. We already read earlier in the beginning of 1 John 2. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation. He's the payment for our sins. This matters. It's not just, a, again, tacking on a religion to your life. Anybody can do that, but it's, it's a change of everything, a change of outlook and perspective and purpose. This is a little bit longer, and so you may want to turn there. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 3, so if you want to flip to that or turn that on. Listen to the way, it's, it's like a prayer almost that, that Paul starts with. It's a blessing, um, but listen to what he describes how he describes Jesus and what he's done in our lives. Just listen to this or look at it. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In him, we've obtained an inheritance, having been pre destined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. A couple more verses. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. That's eternity he's talking about, to the praise of his glory. That is an amazing, it's actually one sentence from Paul. He just goes on and on. Jesus isn't just something to tack onto your life. He changes everything. Again, it changes everything. So realize that what you believe about Jesus actually matters. It matters to affirm and accept and believe and place your trust in that because that's what you get. New life, salvation, eternity. It's not just some haphazard thing. This is an incredible, incredible change of life. So that's first and realize that. Second, live by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Do you know the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make you holy? That's the goal. That's what he's all about. Sanctification is the, the fancy Bible word for it. To make you more like Jesus. Uh, you're, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Saying sexual sin is in a different category for a reason because it involves uh, your physical body and you know who you are. But then he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Live by the Spirit. The Bible is full of instruction about what to do about the Holy Spirit. Uh, commands like walk in the Spirit, don't grieve the Spirit. Uh, we're supposed to display the fruit of the Spirit. So we have this indwelling Holy Spirit, and God uses the Spirit all the time to direct and guide and remind and convict and uh, fill us with joy and, and do all kinds of things. Listen to Galatians 5. This is verse 16. He just says it straight up. I say walk by the Spirit. That means obey the Spirit. And if you, you don't know what the Spirit wants from you, he gave us the Bible. He gave us the Word of God. But here it says, And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of your flesh, the things you just want to do apart from God on your own, the, the including evil things, 
they're against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. You know how this is. There are times we desire to do or say or be about something we just know is flat out wrong. And the spirit says, I'm against that. But then, a little bit later, he talks about the fruit of the spirit. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is how you know you're walking by the Spirit. Like these things are showing up in your life by His grace and power. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Meaning, seek to obey, to follow God, and you will see when love shows up in your life, that's a fruit of the Spirit. When you're filled with joy, when you're at peace, all those things, even self-control, those are things that we can grow in and ask God to grow in us. So walk by the Spirit. The, the last one is let the Word transform you. When it says abide, that's like getting down deep into who we are. It's, to abide is to dwell, to live, like live in the Word. And I don't mean you have to read the Bible all day, but let the Word affect your life, change your life. The Spirit gave us the Word, and that's what He wants to use partly to change us. He can use anything to change us, situations, family members, friends, whatever, but He wants to use the Word of God to transform us. So, a couple simple questions. Do you spend time in the Word, like reading the Bible and studying it? Um, if you're around here, we have all kinds of Bible studies and ways to help you with that. Um, do you talk about the Word with other people? Do you discuss it? Do you encourage people with it? And then what do you do with the truth you do know? We talk about this often because I've, I've read the Bible a lot. Uh, I know a lot of stuff about it, but do I do it? Do I actually live it out? It's a good question to continuously ask. What do you do with the truth you know? Like right now you're listening to a sermon. It ought to be that we're looking for the, okay, God, what can, I, what can I put into my life out of that? How can I live that out? Or how can I apply that in a situation in my life? We've got to be just on the lookout for those things. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So if it's dwelling in us richly, it's going to come out in our lives. We're going to be encouraging people with it. And this is, you know, it's admonishing and teaching and encouraging. Just, we're, it's going to spill out everywhere. So do you spend time reading it? What do you do with it? Uh, the last one is, is just live it by teaching it, making disciples. Jesus left us with his final command. You know this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. There's that end again. Jesus left us with this this. Uh, job description, this is who we are, is disciple makers. We're just supposed to go and make disciples, teach people how to follow him. Uh, right before we recorded this, um, I got to go to lunch with a friend and, and he wanted to get together and just talk and, and get some advice about stuff. And it always goes like this. When I'm, I'm like, okay, this is part of who I am as a disciple maker. I want this person to know more about how to like follow Jesus and how to live for him. But what always happens is it's not just a one-way thing. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go teach this guy some stuff. But I, I, I get great encouragement and often teaching and whatever out of it, too. And this is incredible. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that God has let us be a part of. And it's not complicated. If you know something about how to follow Jesus, you can disciple. You can teach somebody else how to do that. You can introduce them to Jesus and then help them do that. I hope that uh, this passage will just sink deep in our hearts so that we know how to stand for truth and we know how to live by the Spirit and let the Word transform us as we do that. So let me say a prayer to that end. God, we're so grateful um, that you are committed to making us more like Jesus. God, I pray that you would find us faithful to the truth and we would um, be ready to be corrected. We would be ready to be teachable. Um, God, that you would help us to have the word of God, the gospel be the center of all that we think and do. And God, anytime we, we uh, get out of that, have, have uh, use your spirit, your word, and other people to correct us in that so that we would stand for you. Thank you for your word again today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, again, we're good to see you. I mean, I can't actually see you, but we're glad you're here with us. And uh, let us know if there's some way we could pray for you or come alongside you. And uh, we'd love to, again, see you in person if we get the chance sometime soon. Have a great week.